Hi, thank you for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel, and this video is part of a series of videos on Proclus's Elements of Theology. Today I'm going to focus on Propositions 6 and 7. I consider these two propositions to be foundational in the sense that these are the foundation that later propositions are built on. So these two are both very important to understand. Now, throughout this series of videos, I am using the E.R. Dodds translation. Um, I will include a PDF link for those of you who don't have the text. For those of you who do, it looks something like this. I have seen the same uh, book with the same artwork, but with a black cover, so you may have seen it that way as well. But either way, um, that is the text that I'm using, and there will be a PDF link for those of you who don't have the text. Um, that said, let's jump into it. So today I'm going to be using slides because I want to be able to do a little more with them and these two are not very long. Um, so Proposition 6 states that every manifold is composed either of unified groups or of henats. Henat is actually a transliteration of a Greek word which means oneness or as Dodd puts it, units. And we're also going to see how he describes what these unified groups are. So his explanation starts like this. For it is evidently impossible that each constituent of a manifold should be in its turn a pure plurality, and each constituent of this plurality again a plurality. So what he's saying there is that for any manifold or manyness, the parts of it cannot be pure pluralities. Because if they were, then those parts in turn would be pluralities and so on forever. In fact, we really couldn't even talk about parts technically because each part is a one. But for the sake of discussion, we will say so. But um, So you can't have um, plurality forever. That's the idea of the um, infinity of infinites, I think is how he put it in Proposition 1. And that was discarded back in Proposition 1. That is impossible. Now, if the constituent part is not a pure plurality, then it would have to be either what he's calling a unified group or what he's calling a henad. So now he has to explain what these two things are. So a unified group is if it has unity by participation. Now, I think that this requires a little bit of um, discussion, a little clarity here, because of the word unity. Um, it has more than one definition, and I talked about this a little bit in my last video, Propositions 1 through 5, that there he's using unity for toenos, which is often translated as the one, and toenos is actually also here as well. So we can talk about unity as in parts functioning together in a certain way, like our bodies can function because the parts each carry out their own proper function and they work together. We call that a unity. But he is using the word unity in a pure sense. It is one. And so here he's talking about having unity by participation. And this is something very confusing because what we saw in Propositions 1 through 5 is that the one does not participate anything. It is participated. It is the first principle of all and therefore it doesn't participate anything. And so how can it have unity by participation. Um, so we have to hold on to that question. Um, we might define it as being made one by participation, but we still have to question what we're talking about there, and we'll come back to that before the end of this, of, of, uh, this proposition. And then he describes a henad as being a constituent of the first unified group. So um, if you are talking about a hierarchy of participants, as we do in our metaphysics, the unfolding of reality, then if you have a hierarchy of participants, there must be a first participant, and that would be the first unified group. So we'll call the henad a member of that first unified group. He goes on to say that if there is a one itself, it must have a first participant, which is the first unified group. Now notice here that he changed the language from the one to the one itself. This he introduced in propositions four and five. 
And this is really important to understand the definition of unified group. The type of unity that we call a monad is different from the one itself. It's the difference between the one and a one. So monads are also ones, but they're not the one. They fall short of the one because they are these unified groups. Now, as for the henads, the henads are the first participants of that unified, of the first unified group. So this first group must be composed of henads, he tells us. For if they be composed of unified groups, these in turns will be composite unified groups made up of unified groups made up of unified groups and so on to infinity. And that would be impossible. And so the first unified group is composed of henads. And so we can say that our initial statement is indeed true, that every manifold is composed either of unified groups, which is a group made one by participation, or it's made up of henads, which are members of that first unified group. Okay, so that's proposition six. Proposition seven is introducing the idea of cause. We haven't yet talked about causes. Propositions one through five looked at the one in that which participates in it, but it didn't yet talk about where those participants come from, what caused them. So Proposition 7 states that every productive cause is superior to that which it produces. So basically, A produces B, and he's stating here that A must be superior to B. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if it is not superior, it must be either inferior or equal. And this is a very common way that Proclus likes to argue. He'll give all of the logical possibilities and show why only one of them can be true. So either A is superior to B, A is equal to B, or A is inferior to B. Those are the only three possibilities logically. So he says, let us first suppose that it be equal. Now, either the product has itself the power to produce a further principle, the product being, we're calling it B, to produce a further principle C. Either it can produce C or it's altogether sterile. Okay, so A produces B. We're imagining them to be equal in power. B can either produce C or it cannot. Now, if it be supposed to be sterile, it is thereby proved inferior to its producer because the impotent is not equal to the fecund in which is the power of creation. Okay, so this would be impossible. We have to cross that possibility out. A can produce B, but B cannot produce C. By that very point, it is, B is showing itself to be inferior. So this would be impossible. If A can produce B, B must be able to produce C. If, um, if we're assuming them to be equal, excuse me. So if it be productive, then the further product, C, will again be either equal to its cause or unequal. Okay, so A again produces B and we're imagining them to be equal. So either C is also equal or it's in some way unequal. We don't know greater or less, but in some way unequal. Now, if it be equal, and this is true universally, that the producer generates a consequent equal to itself, then all beings will be equal one to another, in no one better than another. So everything is equal. A produces B, which produces C, which produces D, and E, F, G, H, and on and on and on. If they're all equal, it means there's no unfolding of reality. There's no divine realm down to our physical realm. We can see in our own experience that not all the realms are equal, and so our own experience tells us this cannot be the case. Now, if it be not equal, then neither was the former product equal to the former producer. For equal powers create equals, and if a cause not being equal to its consequent were yet equal to its own prior, then we should have here equal powers creating unequals. 
Okay, so it wouldn't be logical. A is equal to B, and B produces C, which is equal to it, but then how could C create something that is not equal to A or B and to itself? So we already saw that, um, we're going to see very soon, actually, that, it, that D cannot be greater than C, and now we see that it also wouldn't make sense for it to be inferior. Why would C create something that is inferior if it's otherwise equal in power? And so the conclusion there is that it is impossible that the product should be equal to the producer. So there we have a conclusion. It is impossible for B to be equal to A. However, we're not done. Remember what we started with the sentence here, that if it is not superior, if A is not superior to B, then it must be either inferior or equal. We've only crossed out equal. We haven't yet crossed out inferior. So that's what Proclus needs to talk about next. And he says that it's impossible that the producer should ever be inferior. So we had these three possibilities. And again, we crossed out A is equal to B. That one proved to be impossible. So now he's saying that it's also impossible that A is inferior to B. And if he can make his case, then we're left with only the conclusion that A is superior to B, that causes are superior to their consequence. For as it gives the product existence, A gives, its, um, A gives existence to B. It must also furnish the power proper for that existence. So for anything to exist, it, has, it needs power to exist and power to function. And that power must also come from the cause. But then he goes on to say that if it is itself, if A is productive of all the power, which is in B, then A is also able to create a like character in itself. In other words, it could increase its own power. The means to this cannot be lacking since it has force sufficient to create. It could create B, therefore it must have that power because it gave that power to B. Nor can the will be lacking since the nature, since by nature, excuse me, all things have appetition of their good. All things desire their good. And this is something that was well accepted by the Platonists. I think it's just kind of slipped in here. The good is actually introduced propositions 8 through 13. I think Proclus could slip it in because this was something that was well accepted um, in his day. Therefore, were it able to fashion another thing more perfect than itself, it would make itself perfect before it's consequent. Why would it not? And since then, the product is neither equal to the producer nor superior to it. The product is necessarily superior. Sorry, the producer is necessarily superior to the product. And so we're seeing here again that the cause is not equal to its product and the cause is not inferior to its product. If we cross those two possibilities out, the only thing left is to say that causes are superior to their products. And this, we can, I think, already foresee is going to be an important um, foundation for the unfolding of reality from the most potent down to the weakest and also the most unified down to the most differentiated. So these two propositions, six and seven, are both key to understanding things as we go forward. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email. There is an email address at the bottom of the description box. Also feel free to leave me a comment. And uh, if you liked this video, here are two more you may like. And uh, please hit the like button if you enjoyed this. Please subscribe if you don't already. And I do hope you'll join me next time. Thank you very much.